In Acts, the first chapter, reading at verse 1, the former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began, can I hear you say began, both to do and teach. Until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Notice especially here in Acts chapter 1 verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive. I'll tell you, life means more to me today than at any other time in my existence, the life of God to whom also he showed himself alive. After his passion, after the resurrection, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. I especially want to call your attention to the fact that Jesus showed himself alive by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You don't see dead men walking and you don't hear dead men speaking. Not in this world you don't. The Bible plainly tells us that when Satan did all he could do, and believe me, he did all he could do, that it was not enough. Satan could not keep him in the ground. Up from the death, he arose. Up from the grave, he arose. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me over to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. I love this portion of God's Word. There's just portions of God's Word that say it all in a few verses. It's all good, but this is one of those powerful chapters. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which... Also you're saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. And after that He was seen of about five hundred brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. And after that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, Paul said he was seen of me, also as one born out of due season. I think because of Paul's putting Christians to death, he wrestled with this. And I think the statement comes out of that heart that occasionally would drift back for a moment. And then Romans 8 would kick in <laughs> where Paul said, I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his glory which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so you believe. We preach and you believe. While we were in Jerusalem a few days ago, that verse from Acts just began to leap from the pages of my Bible to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. I have an old Webster's Dictionary. I like it. So many things are being tampered with nowadays. 
Our history books are being tampered with. Our forefathers now are being painted and pictured as perverts. And they're telling us that really America was not founded as we know from the true historical facts by people who came to this land to have religious liberty. We're living in a changing world, but thank God our God changes not. And I believe this statement is so important to us in the day in which we live because it said that he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. Now, I was looking in the old Webster's Dictionary. In fact, it was our old family dictionary. There's some things that I wanted more than other things that were left behind by my father and mother. And that was one of them, that old dictionary. The word infallible, well, it means not fallible. Not capable of error or mistake. Not liable to fail, deceive, or disappoint. That which is sure and certain as infallible evidence. Infallible evidence. That which contains no errors. That which is inerrant. Concerning proofs, Mr. Webster said, that degree of knowing arising from evidence which convinces the mind of any truth or fact and produces belief and demonstration. Going on, Mr. Webster says, properly speaking, proof is the effect or result of evidence. And as I looked at that verse, to whom he showed himself alive after his passion, by infallible proofs, that which was not fallible, that which was not capable of error or mistake, not liable to fail, deceive, or disappoint, that which is sure and certain, infallible evidence that contains no errors, proofs, the degree of knowing arising from evidence which convinces the mind of any truth or fact and produces belief and demonstration. It's impossible to believe without demonstrating. This is why the Apostle Paul, who experienced the miracle encounter with the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus, said so simply and yet so powerfully in 2 Corinthians 4, 13, I have believed and therefore have I spoken. I believe it and I say it with all my heart. You say, how can you say that you're born again? Because I am. I believe it with all of my heart. How can you rejoice in the blessed Holy Spirit? Because I have been filled. I believe that with all of my heart. I have believed. And therefore I speak out of the overflow of what I believe. I was listening to the radio the other night with the Steve Solomon. I thought, what a miracle. Son of Abraham, completed. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You don't know what a miracle this is until you go over to Israel and see the veil that is still over their eyes and the blindness that is there. And every time I see a born-again believer, a true son of Abraham, my heart rejoices and says, thank God the veil was torn away. Here's another miracle. Here's another infallible proof that Jesus is alive. Paul also declared in 2 Timothy 1.12, I know, well, in fact, he said, I'm not ashamed, for I know in whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Thanks be unto God. Oh, Dr. Luke said in Luke chapter 1, verse 1, that he's writing about things which are most surely believed. Why do you believe it, Luke? Because it happened to me. How can you speak with such heart certainty, Luke? Because he said, I have received. It's happened to me. I believe, and therefore I speak. In fact, I 
never ceased of reading that last verse in the Gospel of John, chapter 21. And there are many also other things which Jesus did, the which if they could be written, everyone, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. If everything that Jesus did was put in a book, there would not be enough libraries in the world to contain all that happened. You say, well, we read it all in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. No, you just see a little sampling. You don't see all that he did. One day we'll hear and see it all infallible proofs of the resurrection. Number one, after the resurrection, Jesus was seen of them for 40 days. Now, I know sometimes in one of these tabloids, you'll see some far out story, you know, that someone saw something or heard something, and I pray God they did. But for 40 days, the buzzword around Jerusalem was, he's alive. <laughs> How do you know? I saw him last night. He came into our prayer meeting. He's not like he used to be. He doesn't open the door. He just comes through the wall. <laughs> oh, the talk of Jerusalem was that Jesus is alive, not for one day, two days, three days, four days, five days. For 40 days, he was seen of them. He was seen of Peter. Peter saw him. The disciples saw him. All the apostles saw him. In fact, before he was taken away, over 500. You know, we talk about 500, but the Bible said that there were over 500. More than 500 saw him. More than 500. He was seen of James. Last of all, Paul said he was seen of me. Paul, the man who was born out of due season. Jesus was seen by hundreds of people, maybe thousands, I don't know, but I know at least hundreds of people for 40 days saw Jesus after the resurrection. But not only did they see him, secondly, Jesus was heard speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus was heard speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, I'll tell you, that would get your attention. The last time you saw him or heard about him, he was nailed to the cross of Calvary. But for 40 days, everywhere you look, yes, I saw him. Oh, you saw him too. They just kept, for 40 days, he's everywhere. He's everywhere. He's coming through walls. He shows up on the seashore with the fire and loaves and fishes, feeds them. Jesus was seen, but thank God Jesus was heard. And thirdly, another infallible proof, not only was Jesus seen, not only was he heard, but Jesus met their needs. Bless their hearts, some people still don't quite understand. If you pastored, you'd understand how a pastor's heart goes out to see people's needs met. I know money's not everything, but it sure does pay the rent. It sure does fix an old tire or buy a new set of tires. It helps clothe your children. It helps finance the kingdom of God in the end time. Money isn't everything, but try living without it. And yet here are these disciples who said, I go a-fishing, and the other disciples go with him. I believe there were some seven of them in the boat. And God help us never to forget this. They fished all night, and they caught nothing, typical of every one of us in our own strength and in our own energy. Before I left the home this morning, I knelt before God and said, God, for 32 years, we've trusted you. Maybe not perfectly, but God, we've trusted you. I've trusted you as best I know how. I trusted you when we signed the lease in the former property. I trusted you when we opened the doors. I trusted you when the multitude stayed away. I trusted you, Lord, because what we're basically seeing during these days is what I saw before we even started on Westbury Street. 
I saw a church with a worldwide vision. I saw a church with a vision for missions. I saw a church with a vision for going out into the communities and the neighborhoods. I saw a church going into the prisons. I saw a church praying 24 hours a day. I saw a church with a Bible school whose graduates are all over the world. I saw a church with a Christian school, but we just couldn't do all that where we are. And even though we filled up that former building, God brought us to where we could fulfill the vision. But you see, this is what I realize. In everything we've ever done, it seems like there's a fishing all night and catching nothing that throws you upon the grace of God. You know, when you first started ministering, you just knew that the calls would just come in from everywhere. It didn't happen that way. But you see, they fished all night. They caught nothing. But the thing I love about Jesus, he's always there when the morning comes. <laughs> and just as sure as daylight began to break, they're frustrated, they're tired, they're commercial fishermen. They know how to fish, but they have not caught one little minnow. And there's Jesus on the shore asking him the inevitable question, have you caught anything? And Jesus said, cast your net on the right side of the ship. Now, how wide can a boat be? That boat we were on in the Sea of Galilee, I, they said that it was quite authentic as far as its size. And, and I walked it. You know, it didn't take long to walk from one side of that boat to the other. You could do it very quickly. And Jesus said, if you'll just cast your net on the other side. It wasn't geographically the waters on the other side of the boat. It was an act of obedience. It was an act of trust. It was being willing to do something foolish. It was being willing to trust God. You say, well, what if we don't catch fish on the right side? Well, what if you do? Well, what if it doesn't work? Well, what if it does? What if, what have you got to lose? You fished all night and caught nothing. The man just may know what he's talking about. They did. He did. The fish did. And the rest is history. 153 fish filled the nets. I think what I'm trying to say is very simply put, Jesus still meets needs today. I remember when Joy and I first married and in Bible college, and I'm going to tell you, you know, if you ever put a little bless me offering in the hands of a Bible school student, don't stand around. Don't stand around. Get out of their way so they can open it up and see what it is. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you, a little bit would go a long way. And I can think of some things that I will not get into this morning that helped us to exist along the way. I did some different kind of things, but it worked. I was willing to do what I could do with my hands. But I want you to know this morning that Jesus will meet your needs. If your marriage is fished all night and it seems like nothing's happening, God's here to bring restoration to your home. Maybe there's an irreconcilable type of situation I'm not the judge of that, but if there is, God's here to heal your broken heart. No matter what the tragedy or the loss may have been, Jesus is here to fill your nets and to meet your need today. Oh, that's an infallible proof. I mean, someone meets you on the seashore, and fills up your nets with fish, and then when you arrive at the shore, he also has cooked fish and bread. Breakfast with Jesus. My, my. But you know, there's other things that I would call your attention to. I'm not trying to be prolific this morning. I'm just trying to speak out of my heart. You know, the Bible tells us that, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest proof that Jesus was and is the Son of God is changed lives. You see, I, <laughs> a pastor will... If he goes to the grave, I think we're closer to going in the rapture. But you'll go with a million secrets of all that you've seen in people's lives. But I'm here to tell you today that Jesus is a life changer. He'll not only change your life, but he'll continue to change your life. And he's here this morning not to change us a little bit. God's here to do massive surgery. And I believe I'm closer to the Lord this Sunday than I was a year ago. I believe I know more about him. Jesus touched and changed my life. He touched and changed Peter's life. He called me into the ministry, called Peter into the ministry. 
But there's something else that touched my heart. After the resurrection, the first appearance that Jesus made was to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven devils. Interesting, isn't it? Probably wouldn't have been your first choice. But I want you to know that there's a marvelous message of the grace of God. This woman out of whom seven devils was cast. In fact, I, I just looked at what preceded that in this precious woman's life. The Word of God said over in the 20th chapter of John, you say, how can Jesus be made real to me? Well, in verse 11, chapter 20, verse 11, Mary stood. She stood without the scepter. She went to the place that she identified as being the presence of the Lord. That's all she knew. Mary was weeping. God blesses broken hearts. She not only wept, but she stooped down. She was willing to kneel. Willing to kneel. And she looked into the sepulcher. I mean, why look in if you're not expecting something? This woman had faith. This woman took time to come to the last geographical location where she knew that Jesus had been. This woman spent time there. She wept there. She knelt there. She looked there. And guess what? Two angels were sitting there. <laughs> I tell you, God has a way of showing up when people start looking for Him. A man gave me this testimony this morning. He said, I'd given my life to Christ. And I'm paraphrasing just a tiny bit here just to give you the story. In other words, he had given his life to Christ. God's done a lot of things in his life, but he still was having a battle with a desire for alcohol. And he said the taste and, 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 and the temptation would come. Now, it's not always that way, but it was, that was his testimony. But it's almost two weeks ago, he said, I cried out and said, God, I don't know what to do about this. I don't want this. If you don't help me, I don't know what to do. And he said, he said that Jesus appeared to him. And he said, you know, Pastor, ever since I saw Jesus, that thing's gone. The alcohol is gone. The taste is gone. You say, I wished I could see Jesus. I do too. But I do. I see him in the Word. I see him in you. I see him in the altar calls. I see him in the prayer meetings. I see Jesus everywhere I look because he's alive. The tomb is empty. And he's alive. I heard a, in fact, I read it, a modernist or liberal, whatever you want to call him, supposed to be a minister, had an article in some paper three or four years ago. He said, well, it really doesn't make any difference if Jesus w was raised from the dead or not. He was a good man. He was a good teacher. That's all that really mattered. Not. You missed the point. You better know he was a good teacher, but he was more than a teacher. You better know he was a good preacher, and he was more than a preacher. You better know he was a miracle worker, but he was more than a miracle worker. Paul Harvey, in his own way, I wished I could relate it like he did. But I heard him yesterday, and he has a unique way of saying some things. There was a very famous preacher, and I guess it hasn't been that long ago. He was standing outside of his house, and this little boy came with a little beat-up-looking birdcage and just kind of banging it on trees and the fence. You know how little boys are. And there were little birds on the inside just a-fluttering, and it was a pretty pitiful situation. Bird cage, birds inside the cage, and the little boy just had him a new toy. And the preacher said, what, what have you got there? He said, I've got some birds. And he said, what are you doing, son? He said, well, I caught me some birds in a trap. He said, well, what are you going to do with those birds? He said, I'm going to play with them. I'm going to have fun. He was banging this old cage around. And he said, then what are you going to do? He said, well, I'm going to take them home, feed them to my cat. My cat likes birds. 
And the elderly minister said, Son, he said, uh, Would you sell me that bird cage and those birds? Oh, he said, Mister, these are just sparrows. No one wants them. He said, You don't want these birds. Oh, yeah, he said, I do. He said, What would you take for it, son? The little boy scratched his head and he said, Two dollars? He said, Yeah, I'll do that. The minister gave him two dollars and got the bird cage. In fact, he brought the bird cage to the pulpit on a Sunday morning. That beat up bird cage was there by the pulpit. And some of you are preaching ahead of me this morning. His message was simply this that many years ago, Satan put humanity in a cage. An old, rusty, terrible prison. And he was just going around, just banging humanity any way he wanted to. Against the rocks, against the trees, against whatever. And Jesus came by and said, what are you doing there, Satan? He said, I've got me some captives. He said, what are you going to do with them? He said, I'm going to torment them. I'm going to play with them. I'm going to cause heartache and financial disaster and divorce and perversion, and dope addiction." I'm going to cause them to kill each other and hate one another and have wars. Jesus said, what would it take to buy that back? And He said, all your blood. And so Jesus went to that cross of Calvary. And he did give all of his blood. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he chose not to. Because when he was on the cross, you and I were on his mind. Suffered a death, suffered scourging, suffered beating that goes beyond anything we could understand today. But thank God there was a day, thank God there was a day, thank God there was a day when he came out with the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And he said, give me that bird cage. And just as the elderly minister when he bought the old battered bird cage and the birds, as soon as the little boy was out of sight, you know what he did. He opened the door and let the birds fly out. So when Jesus, praise God, through his precious blood, through the finished work of Calvary, came forth victor over death, hell, and the grave, he said, Give me that bird cage, devil. <laughs> Give me that prison. Set the captives free. He opened that door. And thank God the thief came but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and have life more abundantly. Oh, open the door of the bird cage and let the bird fly free, redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. The final one that I would share, and I'm not going to tarry there long because it happens around here all the time. Someone said, is there any other proof that you have that Jesus is alive? Well, to me, there's one very important proof. The, the most important proof is when someone's born again. But you know one thing that made the altar call so effective this morning? Because the one giving the altar call has been filled with the Holy Spirit. I didn't say you can't win souls without the Holy Spirit, but I'm going to tell you it's important. It's so important to have this mighty presence of God. Because any of us in the ministry realize how frail we are. But we realize how powerful he is. And before he went away, he commanded them to go to the upper room. <laughs> really wasn't fancy, was it? Kind of plain, but it was an upper room. And he's told 500 people, go tarry until you be endued with power from on high. 500 heard it, 120 did it. Don't get upset if everyone you witness to doesn't come to Jesus. 120 stayed in the upper room. And they voted. They thought they had to fill the place, and they voted on poor Matthias, and we don't hear about him from that day forward. I guess God was really impressed with that election. But thank God the Bible said there was a moment when they were in one mind and in one accord, and there was a mighty wind that filled the house. The Spirit of God filled that house. There was a fire that began to burn. There was a wind that began to blow. There was a godly unity, and only God can get Christians together. You think that's some small feat? Only the Spirit of God can bring people together in one mind and one accord. 
Suddenly there appeared to them cloven tongues like as a fire, and there was a wind that filled the house, and they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. I just submit it to you. I know that another infallible proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is every time I hear a born-again believer speak in their prayer language. I say, he made it back. He kept his promise. He kept his word. And the Spirit of God's all over this auditorium this morning. I like what Andrew Womack said. Who wants to be the cleanest sinner that ever went to hell? One bullet will take you out. See, one bullet will take All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But it's God's grace that can kiss away every sin. The ugliness, the ugly things that happen between races and colors, languages, I'll tell you, there's only one thing that can make us one, and His name is Jesus through the blessed Holy Spirit.